All right. Well, welcome to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Farming for Life, Using Body Mechanics and Other Tools to Do What You Love Longer. I'm Jessie Schmidt, and I work for the UVM Extension New Farmer Project and the Women's Ag Network. I'll be moderating uh, the session this evening. Our presenters are Ann Adams and, and Liz Bresinger. Um, they are organic. They were organic market growers, uh, market growers for 15 years, and have been avid gardeners even longer. With backgrounds in nursing and public health, they now co-own Green Heron Tools, the first company in the world dedicated to scientifically designing agricultural tools for women. So, welcome, Ann and Liz. We're really happy to have you here this evening. Thanks. We're happy to be here. Well. Um, I guess what we really wanted to do, first of all, was tell you a little bit about our story. I mean, doesn't everybody want to tell their story? I love stories. Um, and ours is going to be basically true. Um, as Jesse said, we've been uh, market growers for quite a few number of years. Uh, started out as actually growing for my son's restaurant because he couldn't get heirloom and heritage varieties that he wanted. And so we started on a small scale then and worked ourselves up to growing for two farmers markets. And in that context, we joined lots of different organizations, PASA, Wagon, PA Wagon, um, and some other organizations, put, which put us in contact with a lot of other growers. And even through the farmers markets, we got to chat with a lot of women farmers, um, men farmers who were having difficulty with some of their tools. And as an adjunct, we wanted to add a place where basically women could go one spot on the Internet because we know women farmers are so busy that they could just find everything in one place. And so we thought we'd do that. So we started to look for tools to put on our website to start a business which would eventually evolve into Green Heron Tools. Surprisingly, well, probably not surprisingly, um, we found that there really weren't any tools designed specifically for women. And at that point, we made a commitment to try to change that. So in 2008, we actually um, started Green Heron Tools. And that was basically to um, provide high quality tools and equipment for women farmers and gardeners. And as I'm talking about this and as I'm telling the story, as I was thinking about this before we got started, I was thinking, I think everything happened backwards. Because first of all, we were going to accumulate tools and make them available to women. There were no tools. Okay, and then we decided, well, we're going to make, find some tools. We did find some tools, and we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later, how that happened. And then we found out that People didn't particularly know how to use them and to use them correctly to prevent injuries. And then to even go back a step farther, we found out that most people actually didn't know how to use their bodies in ways that would facilitate them achieving their uh, uh, tasks without injury to it. That's an add-on and that's basically why we're doing this uh, little presentation tonight. But to continue with our story, um, in 2009 we received a USDA Small Business Innovative Research Grant um, and that was titled Need for and Feasibility of Designing, Producing and Marketing Agricultural Tools and Equipment for Women. And there's a little story that goes with that and I'll just tell it to you very, very quickly is that when we were researching and trying to find tools for women, we actually met this woman at Penn State University who was involved in agriculture and PA wagon. And we were telling her what we were trying to do. And she said to us, you know, within the next two weeks there's going to be a grant application coming out and I think you fit it perfectly. And that was just like, can you believe it? She tells us after talking to her that we could apply for a grant in two weeks. And so we did. Um, and actually, in 2009, we did receive the grant. There's a lot involved in what we had to do for that grant, but I'll hand it over now to Liz Brantinger, and she's going to tell you about the journey to her shovel. 
<laughs> well, actually, one of the things that um, helped us along the way was that it just so happened that not only will we market growers, but we also were grant writers. So when we heard about the grant opportunity, it just seemed like a lot of things coming together. Um, the main deliverable, if you will, from that first grant is um, a product that we were thrilled to introduce last September, and that is a shovel designed specifically for women. Um, that doesn't mean that men can't use it or that it isn't um, a good tool for some men, but it's really based on women's bodies and how we shovel, which is different from how men shovel. Um, and so there you see uh, the first in our own line of tools. What we're up to now, in addition to um, letting folks know about the shovel, is we have a second SBIR grant which is all about finding something to take the place of a full-size walk-behind rototiller. What you see there is um, a front-time tiller that just about killed both of us over a number of years. So we uh, are working on this project not just because we ourselves can't stand rototillers, but because a survey that we did with women farmers and gardeners across the country um, in that survey, women farmers and market growers identified a rototiller as a top priority for redesign. So we've got a great team of engineers based at Penn State University, um, some of the same folks who helped us with the shovel, and we're more than halfway through this particular grant project. We also wanted to share with you one of the most wonderful synchronicities and that is, we named our tool company after our market growing business, which was Green Heron Farms, which was obviously named for the wonderful green herons that in some seasons nest on our property. It was about a year after we named our business Green Heron Tools that we came across this information on the web. Lo and behold, green herons are one of the few tool using birds in the world. So we just felt like that is so amazing. We named our business after a bird that uses tools before we even knew that the bird used tools. Okay, now we talked about ourselves a little bit. What we want to do is ask you, and this is where you can um, use the wonderful webinar tool that Jesse mentioned, um, basic yes or no question. Have you ever hurt yourself while farming? Or if anyone's on the call who's um, a gardener or a homesteader, if you could just use that yes or no um, to answer that question. So I guess the green checks are yet, oh, I see. So five people um, reported that they have indeed hurt themselves. And uh, two fortunate people have not, and we hope that, oh, three, so we hope that um, this presentation helps you stay that way. Now, for those of you who have experienced an injury or some other um, condition related to farming or gardening, um, I think what we talked about doing is asking you if you could choose the most recent one that you have had. We have a list of some possibilities on that slide. Or you could also use the chat box to type in what kind of injury um, you've experienced. So it looks to me like we've got six people with lower back pain or other back injury. We can actually make that eight because the two of us could also answer yes to that. We've got one sprain or strain. Sprained ankle. Broken toe. Yeah. Well, the good news, or maybe the bad news, is that those of you who experienced injuries, particularly the lower back pain, sprain strains, etc., you experienced what are known as musculoskeletal disorders. And as you can see on the slide, 
these are actually the leading cause of disability for all folks in their working years in this country. Uh, musculoskeletal disorders are conditions in which parts of the musculoskeletal system, which includes your muscles, your tendons, ligaments, joints, bones, are injured. And basically what often happens is we're just asking our body to do more than it's really prepared to do. You can have acute issues with your musculoskeletal system, like a herniated disc, um, or chronic, meaning they occur over a long period of time. And the best example or the worst example of that is lower back pain. I have to mention, by the way, that Anne and I are used to doing presentations that are really interactive and we love to have questions um, throughout. And so this webinar format is a little challenging for us, but we would invite anyone at any point um, to type a question in the chat box and Jesse has promised to monitor that for us and we'll um, answer your questions as quickly as we can. So one of the issues that a lot of folks are not aware of is that musculoskeletal disorders in farming are a huge issue. Or maybe you are aware because again a lot of you have experienced back pain for example. But a few years back there was a conference I believe in Washington that looked specifically at musculoskeletal disorders in farming. And what they said was it's a near epidemic. There's one and a half times the prevalence of back pain among folks working in production agriculture than folks working in all U.S. industries. And this last bullet point here is something that we feel really passionate about, I guess. Um, you know, musculoskeletal disorders are so common that what researchers have found is that people think it's just a natural part of farming. In other words, I'm a farmer, I've made this choice, I've got to put up with some back pain, I've got to put up with some other kinds of musculoskeletal injuries. And we would like to do our small part in hopefully helping to change that mindset because the reality is even though there's a lot of problems in farming with musculoskeletal disorders, there's a lot that people can do to change that, to reduce our own risk. Now when you look at musculoskeletal disorders in women farmers, it gets even more interesting. Farming is the top occupation associated with musculoskeletal disabilities among women. And it's associated with the second highest severity of disabilities. So the bottom line is that this is a huge issue for farmers in general and in particular for women farmers. So when you think about farming and musculoskeletal disorders, um, you know, we could have maybe had just a blank slide in here and asked people to type in what they thought some of the highest risk behaviors were. Uh, we didn't do that. So first of all, lifting and carrying heavy loads. Heavy loads are considered more than 50 pounds for men and it is absolutely less for women. Interestingly, we weren't able to find in the literature um, the so-called, you know, standards for women lifting. Right. But I personally, this is my personal opinion, it's not based on data is that women really shouldn't lift more than 25 and 30 pounds at the most. And any time you're lifting the 50 pound bags of chicken feed or fertilizer, or whatever you're lifting, that you're at really high risk by doing this. Um, other high risk behaviors, sustained or repeated full body bending, also known as stooping. I mean, how many of you have found yourself bent over at the waist to harvest or to plant. You know, it's a really uh, tempting situation to get into and it's a really hard one on your body. Um, other ones, highly repetitive handwork when you think about clipping, pruning. Um, twisting is another one. And when you think about these, if you combine one or more of these, then you're really putting yourself at risk. So if you think about twisting in the process of lifting something heavy, 
um, you know, that's really a recipe for potentially hurting yourself. Some other risks, some of these um, are particularly rough for women. Whole body vibration. You know, we talked about our project to redesign a rototiller. On the right of the slide there, you see Anne operating, that's a rear time filler, which is a little bit, uh, I won't say easier to operate, but a little bit less hard to operate than a front time. But you still get a huge amount of vibration. And it turns out that vibration actually hurts women um, more quickly than men. Do you want to mention really explain briefly on what A lot that of that has to do with its hormonal. And um, women seem to have um, their joint. To put it easily, it's, they're a little looser. Their joints are, so there's not quite as much stability in the joint. Um, vibration also affects the circulation, especially in the pelvic region, which can cause something known as pelvic congestion. Um, so, women's anatomy and physiology is what really puts them at risk for. Um, vibrational injuries. Um, another connection between um, injuries and agriculture for women is excessive physical strain. And again, a rototiller is a great picture to have on that slide because when you try to maneuver or manage a tiller. Okay, sorry about the, uh, we'll try to speak more loudly. Um, in any case, excessive physical strain leads to injuries in women. And because of some of the factors that Ann just mentioned, because of some of the anatomy and physiology of women, um, we're considered to be at elevated risk for musculoskeletal disabilities. So this is all about getting to the heart of the presentation, which is, okay, we know this is a problem. Many of us have experienced it. How do we prevent injuries, or how do we reduce the risk of injuries? The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are uh, sort of the, the gurus of public health in this country. And essentially what the CDC has said is there are two ways that you can reduce musculoskeletal disorders. One, you can redesign tools, and two, you can redesign how those tools are used, or you can redesign the work process. So we're going to talk a little bit about both of those. Um, I'm going to talk about the tools part. I'm going to turn it back over to Ann, um, and she'll talk more about how do, you, how do you work differently, how do you use your body differently in a more healthy way. So when you think about tools, you know, there's a basic point that I don't know how many folks have actually thought about it, but for tools to work well, they should fit the person using them. You know, back in the old days when blacksmiths made tools for individual people, that wasn't so much a problem. I mean, you got a tool made for you. But since we entered the world of mass production, we've got this sort of one size fits all, which really means one size doesn't fit many, right? So, you know, to have tools that work well for you, they should fit you, they should be truly ergonomic, and we're going to talk in a little bit about what that means. And by the way, I don't know how many of you have noticed that lots of tools are now called ergonomic. What we think that's about is folks are finally getting the message that people are interested in healthier, easier to use tools. So ergonomics is a good thing, but they don't necessarily make the changes in the tools to have them be truly ergonomic. Now, uh, we have this question up here, why do men and women need different tools? Uh, yeah, would, would folks like to, if you have an idea about why women and men need different tools, uh, feel free to use the chat box. We'd love to hear what folks have to say about that. Or maybe you don't think women and men do need different tools. You think they have different enough. Height difference. Absolutely, that's one variable. What else? Our muscles develop differently. Yes, center of gravity.
All right. Can everyone see all of those? Um, everyone gets. Everyone can see what everyone writes. Correct, Jesse? Yeah. Everyone can see what's in the chat box. Okay. So those are all wonderful answers. Very well informed group. That's right. So. Um, as you can see, we have some additional ones as well as some of the ones that you mentioned on this slide. What we did is looked at this from the standpoint of women. Women tend to have 40 to 75 percent less upper body strength than men, 5 to 30 percent less lower body strength. Obviously, women tend to be of smaller stature. The average woman is 5 inches shorter than the average man. We've got narrower shoulders, wider hips proportionally shorter legs and arms. We have smaller grips. Our grip strength has been estimated at 50 to 67 percent that of males. We have greater flexibility in our joints. We have a lower center of gravity. So, you know, the person who said, um, Scott, I guess, that mentioned that he and his wife vary greatly in a number of characteristics, that's really the heart of it. You know, we've had actually some women say to us, well, you know, I'm a tall woman or, you know, I'm pretty strong. You know, that's great, but that doesn't mean that your body works the same as a man's. It doesn't mean that you have the same muscle mass. So, you know, there are some obvious differences, but then there are a lot of less obvious but really significant ones. And um, if you had to guess, which of the characteristics on this slide has probably the most impact on tools use. Um, anybody want to you know, type in what their guess would be? I'm sorry that these aren't numbered, but okay, we've got, we've got a vote for stature, grip size, grip strength. Any other votes? For the one that you think may be the most significant, another stature. Tool weight is certainly a big issue as far as whether an individual tool related to that. And that's, that's, that one is actually related to the variable that we think is probably the most significant. The first one up there. Uh, and that's that uh, women and that's have. That women have we're getting a weird, we're getting um, a weird uh, repeating on our repeating audio. Repeating on our audio. Jesse, do you know, Jesse, uh, what, do you know uh, what might have? Let me see if I can. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, okay. okay. We have one mic. Yep. Are you? Uh, is it better now? It is better now. Okay, can everyone still hear us? Can I get a smiley face or a yes in the chat box? All set. Okay. Thank Great you. Guys. Thanks. We need to hear ourselves. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there's the, uh, <laughs> there's no meaning to talk into yourself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the, so the, the variable related to less upper body strength is huge when it comes to using tools and equipment. And just from the experience of our shovel, um, I'll tell you really quickly something that we discovered through our research, and some of you might already know this from your own experience, but women actually shovel differently from men. We tend to put the blade in at an angle instead of straight in. The reason being that we don't have the upper body strength to just power a blade straight into the ground the way a man can. So that's, that's you know, a shovel is a simple tool, but it's a great example that, you know, we don't have that upper body strength to do a lot of the things that men can do um, easily. We need to use our lower body. So we actually are better off using uh, le the leverage of our lower body to um, use certain types of tools. And tools should be designed for women that capture the strength in our lower body. And make use of it. Okay, so here's the ever popular question: What really makes a tool ergonomic? And the first thing that makes this a little bit of a difficult question to answer is: A tool may be ergonomic for me and not ergonomic for someone else. So when you see tools on the market that say they're ergonomic, what you hope is that the company has made a really serious effort 
to scientifically design something that's going to work well for a particular population. But there's going to be individual variability. So with ergonomics, ideally a tool is ergonomic for you if it does fit you, including variables like grip size, you know, is the weight appropriate, is the length appropriate. It should be easy to use or as easy to use as possible. We have to laugh, you know, people talk about our shovel and, you know, one of the things we have to say is we, we can't say that it makes digging easy because digging isn't easy, but we, we hope it makes it as easy as possible. Um, an ergonomic tool should improve your comfort doing that task, improve your performance, and it should be, um, you know, good in terms of health and safety. So here are some of the tips that you can look for in choosing tools. Um, look for joints that allow, I'm sorry, look for tools that allow your joints to remain in a neutral, a non-bent, non-twisted position. This happens to be a pistol grip at the end of um, a push hoe from the DeWitt company. And you can see that when you're holding a pistol grip, your wrist is straight compared to what you have to do when you, if you didn't have that grip on the end at all and it was just a straight shaft, your wrist would have to be twisted. You want to find tools that have grips or handles that are comfortable and that fit your hands. If a grip is too small, then your fingers are going to get stressed. <laughs> If a grip is too big, then you're not going to have the control. You're going to have the sense that you're going to lose your grip, uh, literally and possibly figuratively as well. <laughs> um, you also want to look for tools that allow your back to remain as straight as possible. So here's an illustration. This is uh, the DeWitt hoe again. Funny story about this. The one on the left, you can see that Anne is obviously um, not in the best position. She's bent over. You can't really tell, but her wrists are twisted. Um, the one on the right, she's able to be upright. She's got her wrist straight. Crazy thing is this is the same hoe head on the end. Um, it's from the same company, but the tool on the left, which is less ergonomic, is the one that is sold most frequently in the U.S. And the reason that um, a lot of folks sell that tool in the U.S. is because it costs so much to ship long tools through FedEx or UPS. So, you know, on the right is this wonderful tool. It's really healthy for you to use, but it's hard to find because here in the U.S. we value shipping costs over uh, utility of a tool. Ergonomics. Tools or equipment, uh, another characteristic is they're easily adjustable. This is a wheel hoe from the company Valley Oak in California. You can adjust the handle height in less than a minute without any tools. So you can have a person, um, myself, 5'3", and somebody who's 5'8", or 6 feet, or whatever, using the same piece of equipment, um, you know, very easy adjustment in between. So that's a piece of, you know, that's a piece of equipment that is, um, in that sense, ergonomic for pretty much anyone. It's also helpful to look for tools that come in multiple sizes. We know from our research that there aren't a whole lot out there. Our shovel is one of them. Um, you can sometimes get tools that are custom made for you. For example, there are two companies that uh, custom make size. One is called Size Supply, which I think is up in Maine, and there's another one called the Maroog Company. Um, both of those companies will actually custom design a size for you based on your arm length, et cetera. You also want tools and equipment that are not excessively heavy, ones that minimize strain, lifting. Um, the photograph at the bottom of that slide is actually a tractor quick hitch. And what that does is allows people to connect or disconnect implements without leaving the seat of the tractor. So for anyone who's used a three-point hitch, if you think about the kind of straining and maneuvering that you have to do and all the opportunities for injury, a hitch like this, which you wouldn't necessarily think of as ergonomic, but we would argue it's ergonomic in the sense that you can do what needs to be done without training your body at all. 
You can also get auxiliary handles that can make the tools that you have more ergonomic. Um, this particular handle is from a company called Modus out of uh, Canada. And they have a D grip, which is what you see and holding. They also have a T grip that you could put at the end of a long handle tool like a hoe. And what this particular D grip allows you to do is remain in a more upright position. You can use it almost like a fulcrum. Mm -hmm. um, and it also helps your wrist stay straight. So you can get, uh, you know, pieces of equipment or just um, add-on handles that can make your own tools function more ergonomically for you. And this is just, this is actually from that company Modus that we mentioned, um, some of the benefits of using ergonomic grips. And again, you know, keeping your wrist ang angle in a near neutral position, um, decreased likelihood of tendonitis, et cetera, remaining more upright. So um, two more slides and then I'm going to turn it over to Ann. The, the second part of what the CDC said can be done is to change how you do your work. And one of the most basic things to do is vary your tasks. I don't know about those of you on this webinar, but I know for myself it's really easy to get involved in doing one thing like weeding, for example, and, you know, wanting to get it done, and before I know it, a couple of hours have passed and I've been in the same basic position using the same muscles and I can barely stand up. So um, it's a really good practice to be mindful about what you're doing and vary your tasks. Um, you can also reduce risk factors such as the heavy physical work, lifting and forceful movements, bending and twisting, whole body vibrations, uh, and highly repetitive tasks. Another way of saying that is you learn to use the correct muscles to complete a task safely and efficiently without undue strain on any muscle or joint. And so welcome to the world of body mechanics, which takes me back so many years ago in my basic training as a nurse. It was the very first thing we learned in nursing school because there were so many back injuries among nurses from lifting patients that it was costing the hospital too much money. So they instituted a very, very um, intense program in teaching nurses how to use their bodies effectively to prevent injuries, and they so substantially reduce back injuries that this is still to this day uh, one of the first things that you're going to learn in any nursing program. And it's all about learning how to use your body. And it actually is very, very simple, but the truth of the matter is there's nowhere that you learn this unless you happen to be in nursing school. Nobody really teaches you about your body, how to use it safely, um, and how to really take care of it. Um, hopefully it's going to have to last you a long, long time. Some of the principles of good body mechanics. One is to maintain a stable center of gravity. And to do that, um, you need to have your center of gravity as low as possible, okay? That keeps um, reducing, um, you don't use one side of the body more than the other side. You have more stability, okay, if your center of gravity is low. So you're going to have actually more stability and you can manage things more safely. The second thing is to keep your back Great. Okay, and we'll have some pictures to show you how to do that. And then the story that you're going to hear forever is to bend at the knees and the hips, okay, not with your lower back. The second thing which is really, really a principle, which is really important, is to maintain a wide base of support. And again, this keeps you in equilibrium that your sides 
each side of your body is going to have equal distribution of weight if you're lifting, of uh, exerting force if you're pushing something. And how you maintain a wide base of support is you want to put your feet a comfortable distance apart. Okay, and one foot only slightly ahead of the other. And I also stress keeping your knees flexed or a little bit soft to absorb, um, absorb jolts. But the other thing it does, if your knees are really, really tight and you twist them, okay, that's going to put undue stress on your ligaments in your knees. So by keeping your knees just a little flat, you can prevent some injuries. And then definitely if you have to turn, whether you're shoveling, whether you're lifting and you have to turn, turn with your feet. In other words, you pivot. You don't twist at your waist, you pivot with your feet. And that keeps your back in the straight position and that prevents back injuries. Another principle of good body mechanics is to maintain the line of gravity. And the line of gravity is the same in men and women, but your center of gravity is lower in women than it is in men. To maintain that line so that you have stability, that you're in balance, you're going to keep your back straight, you're going to avoid the twisting by pivoting, and you're going to, if you're lifting anything, you're going to keep those objects very, very, very close to your body because you want to get it as close to your center of gravity as possible. And then, of course, maintaining good posture is all about keeping your back straight. And we have a picture of, of what good posture can look like. Your buttocks are tucked in. The abdomen pulled up and in. The back is flat. Your chin is in. And your weight is supported on the outside of your feet. And that's an interesting thing that people don't know. And actually, uh, okay. And I'm actually wondering if it might help if you pick up the receiver. Okay. Is this better? Is this better? Anybody? Okay. Good. Uh, sorry about that. Um, keeping the weight on the outside of your foot is really helping you maintain stability and it actually keeps your whole body in alignment. And um, I would suggest everybody try that because we're not really, really conscious of that, but it really is good for stability and balance and actually you won't get as many sore feet. Um, another and last principle of good body mechanics is to keep your elbows tucked in close to your body. Uh, that in a that's, a, that's all I'll say at this point, but there's a really good reason you do that. And here we have Remo, lift with your knees, not your back, okay? So hopefully we're going to be all lifting with our knees, not building pyramids. Okay, here's some techniques for lifting. Use your leg muscles. The leg muscles in our body are very long muscles. Long muscles are the strongest muscles. That's why our backs are not very strong because they're actually much shorter muscles in our back and the tendons and ligaments. So they're not near as strong as our leg muscles. So if you're going to, to lift anything, you want to use your leg muscles. You're going to bend at the knees and hips. You're going to keep your back straight. Lift straight upward in one smooth motion and keep your object close to the body. Jerky motions are a place where you can really, really strain muscles, okay? They're, they're soft and then suddenly you put force on them and that can overstretch them and cause a strain. This is, a, is an example of how you might lift properly. You get that object as close, close to your body as possible. You bend at your knees and your hips. You pick the bag up, keeping your back straight. You're lifting with your legs. You're just standing up. 
and you're holding that bag as close to your body as possible. And that's a good way to prevent injuries. And if you notice, my feet are slightly uh, in a scissor position, um, and I'm putting the weight on the outside of my feet. And I always have another technique for lifting. It's called my grandson, and that works very well <laughs> for me. <laughs> Okay, now we have some techniques for reaching. Uh, stand directly in front of or close to objects. The last thing you want to do is be twisting and reaching up with your arms extended over your head. That's going to lead to some discomfort. Avoid twisting and stretching. Keep your nose between your toes. If your nose is between your toes, you are not twisted. It's just an easy thing to remember, um, and it works. And obviously, get some help if you can't reach. Call for somebody who's the tallest one in your family. Use a stool, use a ladder, okay? But be consciously aware of these things, and that's how you prevent injuries. Now, instead of stooping, which is bending over at the waist, this is the recommended position. Uh, you're going to squat and bend at the knees and the hips. The back is straight, okay? The elbows are slightly flexed, okay? My feet are in a scissor position, and that's actually a pretty comfortable position. When you want to stand up, you simply straighten your legs. And that, again, this is all about preventing back injuries, which, again, is the common, most common MSD um, that people get. Now we're going to talk about shoveling 101. <laughs> uh -uh. You, have, you have narrow beds. <laughs> That's actually interesting, and I, I actually never thought of that. Um, the raised bed? Uh, oh, oh, okay. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> Actually, the best thing is to make um, the beds only four foot wide, especially for women based on women. Three. Between three and four for women based on your anthropometric data, the length of your arms, etc. Uh, they shouldn't be any longer than that, so you can actually extend your arms out into the middle. Um, the bed that we had, um, depends how you're bending. What about straddling a bed and bending over it? Not if you're bending at the waist, okay? Bending at the waist is never, never, never um, a good thing to do. Okay, it's much better to bend down. If you have to, if you're if you're really having trouble reaching the middle of your bed, use a long handled tool. Use something that you can stretch out, not your back, not your arms. Okay, but definitely not straddling a bed and bending at the waist. No. Nope. Sometimes it feels comfortable, but not in the long run because those muscles aren't strong enough to really do anything for any period of time. I hope that was helpful. We'll, we'll discuss more um, at the end of the webinar um, if we want to even get more specific. I think, too, I'll just add that for, for people who are working with um, you know, a lot of row feet, um, I've seen several implements made for farmers where that are on wheels that allow them to sit and roll over their beds um, with the wheels straddling the beds and be able to work from that kind of squatting position, like a sitting position, um, doing their work uh, to avoid, again, that straddling and bending over um, position. So there are some nifty tools that both attach to tractors or are actually moved um, uh, by um, your feet as you're moving down a bed. So. Um, I'll see if I can find some websites to share with those tools. Yeah, there I, I see a lot of those uh, with strawberry growers. They actually lay on them, and that the the implement actually supports the whole body, so that their arms aren't too extended, and they actually work with uh, the berries in front of them. 
And some of those are motorized and some of them aren't. So yeah, there's some real creative things and actually people actually make some of these types of implements themselves. And I think that's pretty awesome. So we're back now to shoveling 101. Um, and this is again to prevent back injuries because shoveling is a place where a lot of people do hurt their back. A lot of times they're shoveling and shoveling and they're not aware that they've been doing it for an extended period of time and they will know later in the day. So in other words, if you're going to have a backache from shoveling, you're not going to notice it right away when you're actually doing the shoveling, but you will notice it later in the day. What happens as those muscles and ligaments get um, stretched too far or overworked, they're going to be little blood vessels that break in the muscles or tendons. And then you're going to get some swelling in them and that's when you're going to get some discomfort. There will also be something called a buildup of lactic acid in the muscles. If you're working a long time in any position using the same muscle over time, you're going to get the buildup of the lactic acid and that will always feel like burning in the muscle and that tells you immediately this muscle needs to be given a rest. And then what happens if you take some time out, the muscle will slowly relax, the blood supply will increase to the tissue and carry away the lactic acid and the discomfort will go away. But anytime you have burning in any of the muscles, they're tired, they need a break, pay attention. So for shoveling 101, we're going to stand with feet in a comfortable position, slightly apart, going to keep your back straight. And again, we want the knees soft. And that's something to really remember. Don't stretch them out tight. That's just too easy to get those muscles, and especially the ligaments in the knee, really, really pulled. So if you have them slightly bent, they're going to give a little bit more if you move too quickly to one side. Um, you want to keep your elbows close to your body. Again, keep maintaining that line, center line of gravity. Then in this case, um, and this is particularly um, pretty much how women shovel because we're going to put, be putting that blade in at an angle is we have to use our lower body strength and that's what works best with our bodies. So in order to capitalize that on our shovel, we have a really large step so women can actually capitalize um, on their lower body strength. But quite frankly, to tell you the truth, men like the shovel. They like the big steps themselves. Um, it, it's actually easier to use than uh, the upper body even for men. You want to keep your wrists in a neutral position, which means they're unbent, they're not twisted. If you notice, my elbows are in close to the body, okay, and this is keeping everything tight, close, center, so there's a lot of stability in my body. And Liz is using her legs now. After she had the blade inserted, um, she slid her non-dominant hand about halfway down the shaft of the shovel while bending at her knees, not at her waist, okay. You can see that that back is slightly bent. But it, the whole back itself, if you look at it, it's pretty straight. And that's what you get when you're using your legs. And so look at her knees. Her knees are bent, okay. She's lifting the weight. And you can see she doesn't have too much dirt on that shovel. And that's a good thing. Don't overload. Don't have too much weight. Um, in order to lift, all she did was straighten her legs. Just straighten them. Although she didn't straighten them tight, they're still slightly bent. Um, and the other thing that she's going to be doing is she's going to be throwing that material in front of her body. She's not going to throw it to the side. And this is something that I see people do all the time. They have a load on the shovel and they twist their whole body to the side to throw the dirt to the side. Where, Wherever you are, you either want to step to the side so that you can throw it in front of you, have whatever you're putting into in front of you. But it's not, we don't want you twisting when you're throwing the dirt because again, those are the times when you can actually hurt your back.
And here's just a few stretching and strengthening exercises. And I really recommend these and do them like before we actually get started, usually around March, working in the um, garden. Um, and I just have a caveat here that I want to say. Uh, within the past six months, there's been some research published that stretching might not be as good as it was once thought to be. This was usually in um, relationship to people who were either runners or some type of um, competitive athlete. And the theory then was that um, when you're stretching your body, it sends neural impulses to your brain, which tells your body that your muscle is being um, a lot of forces exerted upon it, and that actually causes the muscles to contract. Um, I don't think the evidence is, you know, convincing yet. There has to be more research. I think if you stretch properly, I think it's a, um, I think it's probably at this point still healthy, especially if you're not a competitive athlete, although I must say that I do believe farming is definitely an athletic event. <laughs> um, so proper stretching. Anytime you're going to stretch, and actually this is even before you go out to work, okay, on the farm, no matter where you're going, you, you should do some warm-ups first, and that usually I usually run in place, and that's just to increase the heart rate and the blood flow. Um, and that gets all of your tissue well hydrated, um, full of nutrients and oxygen, and ready to go. Perform balanced stretching if you're going to stretch. That means you always do to one side that you do to the other side. Again, avoid overstretching, and I, this speaks to the issue that I just spoke about, some of the new research. Uh, you don't want to stretch till you're uncomfortable. Okay, you, you can almost tell exactly when your body says that's enough. If you go slow, you're much better off. Bouncing and jerking is when you really, really can tear um, ligaments. So you really want to be slow and gentle. And don't forget to breathe. Breathing is really, really important. Even when you're doing hard physical work, whether you know you're, you're working on the three-point hitch or whatever, be conscious of trying to take some deep breaths, deep breaths. Because usually when we're trying to do things, we're going to hold our breath, especially if it's something hard, and you don't want to do that. Okay? Put your body on alert, and you want to be in a comfortable, relaxed position. And here is our list of injury prevention tips. There's not too many. If you can, um, maybe print them out after. They're really simple. Put them up someplace where they can remind you. Uh, one is to stretch prior to engaging in any intensive physical work we just talked about. Sit with your legs instead of your back. Vary your tasks, and that's really, really important. Um, and actually, you do much better if you vary your tasks. If you work at something for a long period of time, your mind kind of wanders, and when your mind is wandering, that's when we're most at risk for committing some boo-boos that can lead to injuries. Uh, if you're burying your tasks, let's say you're weeding for 20 minutes, later on go, go pick some berries, do, um, do some hoeing, um, mow the lawn, go inside. In that way, none of the muscle groups that you use will become overexhausted. Keep the task close to your body. Keep spine and joints in neutral position. Use a wide scissored stance. Keep your nose between your toes. And test the load means that you should see how heavy something is before you actually try to lift it. And then get help and the right tools. And then actually, there's a step further. I mean, it's really important to prevent injuries. But that's just the first step on the road to wellness. And the wellness is learning how to take care of not just your physical body, but your emotional body your spiritual body, all of those are things that make you who you are and all need attention, nurturing, nourishment, 
and that's a whole different seminar. <laughs> um, and what we'd like to do now is do a quick little journey to our website. We just put up a lot of information that is um, supplemental to what's in this webinar. We have some specific stretches and so forth. So I'm going to see if I can figure out how to make this happen. So it's clicking along here. It says waiting for the web tour. Okay, and I clicked. So we're at your site. Looks good. So here's our website, and there's basically two sections. We've got our products. Um, here, obviously, is the product button. Uh, for example, we've got those modus ergonomic grips here and a bunch of other things that you might be interested in. But then we have a whole section on resources. And I'm going to just draw your attention to two of those subcategories. We're really excited. We just got this revised content up about an hour before the webinar. Um, one is this Women in Tools link here. And you can see there's information on why, do, you know, why tools for women, women in farming, um, choosing tools, the kind of tips that we included in the webinar are on here. Um, this tells you how we chose the tools that we sell on our website. Uh, we, our own shovel is what is called ergonomic, which is ergonomic for women. Um, we've got the shoveling 101 information down here under using tools, and we have something called digging the dirt because as all of you know, if you need to do some serious digging, a shovel or spade is only one of the tools that you probably need to use. Then if you come up to the Resources tab again under Staying Healthy, we've got some of the same information again that was in the webinar, the body mechanics basics, basics et cetera. Um, now under Stretching and Strengthening, we have some specific stretches and the um, directions for how to do those. The same thing for um, the strengthening exercises, we have specific ones. There's a great video here, Yoga for Gardeners, from our friends at Rodale.com. Um, we also have uh, a slideshow on ergonomics. So there's lots of information on the website that's intended to help you be healthier, not just in the process of farming or gardening or whatever, but in how you live your life. And I just want to add one thing before we um, hopefully get to some questions. We were out at the Moses Organic Farming Conference in Wisconsin a few months ago. And one of the points that um, Ann made that I think really resonated with folks is everyone there was so focused on taking such good care of their crops, their land, their animals. And our suggestion is that you, the farmer, deserve to take just as good care of yourself as you do of everything else associated with your farm. You know, as, as good care of yourself as you take of your family. Because as all of us know, you know, if you get a serious injury, um, it really affects not only your quality of life, but potentially the viability of your farm, et cetera. So, um, so just, you know, feel free to come back to our website anytime and poke around. And there's some other resources there as well that, including, I'll just make a little pitch. Um, this isn't what I wanted to show you, but we have some wonderful stories on our website as well. And I can see that that one needs to be adjusted. But in any case, um, hope to see you on our website. And now I guess, um, you know, Jesse, there's certainly time for questions that anyone has. Yeah, so um, we do have a uh, a few minutes here. It's 8 o'clock, um, and we usually spend 5 or 10 minutes. So um, type your questions into the chat box if you have a specific issue or chore or um, tool that you're having trouble with, um, resources, uh, injuries that you're dealing with or trying to accommodate. Um, let's see what's going on. And, um, and also, I just want to draw your attention to uh, while we wait for some questions to pop up. Uh, we really, really love to get feedback from people who participate in our webinars. So there's a live link. You can click right on it. It will open up in whatever your browser preference is. 
Um, and if you could just take a minute to fill out our webinar feedback survey, we'd appreciate it. Um, there's also a place in there where you can put your email address in, um, and we can send you further information, um, such as a link to the recording of this webinar, which is going to be posted on our website. We'll also post a PDF of the presentation um, on our website, so you can go through and uh, look at this and review this information again. So. Um, we've got a few questions here. I'll just go ahead and read them off. One uh, question here is, um, is it important to change uh, dominant hands uh, with your grip as far as uh, trying to keep things balanced? I think I know I sometimes do that when I'm hauling, try and flip sides. It, it, it is. Uh, if you can alternate that, if you're that ambidextrous, that's really good. The only time I wouldn't recommend that you do that is if you are doing something that requires a lot of control because the opposite, your dominant hand is always going to exert more control. You just use it more so those muscles are more developed. It's good to switch to the uh, less dominant hand if you're doing something that doesn't require precision and that actually helps build some of those muscles in that hand. And one of the best things is if you can use them both at once. If you have a tool that you can get both hands on at once. Great. Um, and then someone says uh, that she has a trigger thumb affecting the lower joint um, of the thumb on both hands, and she's wrapping tools with foam. Um, but it sounds like that's causing some trouble too, as far as the tools feeling uh, handle feeling too big. For her small hands, any any ideas on that? Actually, um, there's something called mole skin, and that might be better than foam because foam does make that too fat for her hand to grip. It's uncomfortable. Mole skin uh, cushions, but it's not as thick, so that might be a better option is to get some mole skin as opposed to foam. And it's really, really soft on the hands. That's the only thing that I can suggest. Occupational therapists are really the ones to, that are really, really good with in those areas um, of coming up with specific um, adaptations to specific tools. And there's, I'm sure many of you know about the AgriBility uh, program. It's a G R A B I L I T Y. And AgriBility, um, I think it initially started to help farmers who had significant disabilities help them be able to continue to farm. And so it did involve a lot of adaptations to tools and equipment and ways of working. But what we found is many of the things that AgriBility has come up with are appropriate for a wider audience. You know, it's really about, in some ways, using your common sense to adapt your own tools or equipment um, to just make them work better for you. And so AgriBility might be a good resource as well for folks. And most um, state extensions have, uh, depending on what state you're working in, um, have their own AgriBility program. Um, here is a link to Vermont's um, AgriBility uh, program if you want to just learn more about that. All right, any final questions out there? I would just like to add that one of the things that we'd like to do with Green Heron Tools with the resources part of our um, website and our world is to be a clearinghouse for information on things that work well for people. So if any of you have any brainstorms um, about things that have worked well for you that you'd like to share, uh, we'd love it if you would email us. You know, we're going to be adding different sections to our website. Um, we're always looking for recommendations of tools or equipment that work really well for people. And also, you know, people that we've met at workshops and conferences and so forth sometimes have told us about some amazing things that they've come up with um, that uh, just make the job of farming easier, and we'd love to share that. Uh, the name of the company in Canada is Motus, M-O-T-U-S. We do carry their grips on our website. I don't think there are a whole lot of companies in the U.S. that um, carry those grips. But you know, so you can find them with us, or you could do a search, uh, just a general search. Time and motion <coughs> setting specific activities. I have not basically seen any. And one of the interesting things in doing our research is that when we were trying to um, 
um, find out about injuries in women farmers. I, I can tell you in report that it's very sad, but there really hasn't been any well documented um, data or studies involving women farmers. I mean, we found the ones that are out there, there's not a whole lot. Um, they're all done by nurses, right? Yeah. <laughs> Nurse <true>. researchers. <laughs> um, but as far as any, like to recommend how long someone should, should do any one activity for any period of time would be quite difficult because it would really depend upon the physical condition of the person, their age, the activity that they're doing. So um, this is my, this is not science, this is my opinion that if you're doing something for 20 minutes, you should take a break and do something else. Okay, that just gives those muscles a chance to recover. And again, once they recover, the lactic acid's carried away, those muscles are going to be safe to use again. All right, well, Anne and Liz, thank you for this excellent presentation. Um, I certainly learned a lot, and I really appreciate you taking some time this evening um, to share it all with us. Um, so thank you, and um, hopefully we'll be hearing from you again. I'm really looking forward to that uh, rototiller. <laughs> so are we. And thanks a lot to everyone who took their time to be with us tonight. And yeah. You know, if you have any questions that you think of later, send us an email or call us up. Um, there's contact info on our website. All right, and one more time, I'll put in a plug to uh, give us your feedback. Here's the link. Um, we love to get it. We like to hear other ideas for webinars, um, which you can give us in that form. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, and hopefully, uh, the severe storms are not headed your way. Um, so good night, everybody. Nice. Nice.